We are all very familiar with the notion that our mind has a strong influence over our body, but is also the opposite true? I believe that the quality of your body does have an influence on the quality of your mind. Most of our parents would have praised activities such as studying or reading a book, uh, but what about cultivating your body? Often, sport is encouraged as an extracurricular activity. Parents are after the social benefits of a sport or they see the transferable skills such as discipline and consistency which can be applied to other less physical aspects of your life. I have dedicated my own life to cultivating my body and my mind with equal effort. So I would like to tell you why I did it and analyze what real motivation is. I believe that in life everything can be learned or exercised, but motivation is what drives this process. This is true for life generally, but in sport especially, since we need to endure physical pain and fatigue in order to achieve results. So let's begin with motivation. There are, generally speaking, two types of motivation, intrinsic and extrinsic. Commonly used examples for this would be physical pleasure as an intrinsic reward or uh, approval and success as motivation coming from the outside. But let's take a closer look at intrinsic motivation. From neuroscience, we know that our internal reward stimuli are controlled by the synthesis of dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter. And in this neurotransmitter induces two different types of behavior, which I will simply call wanting and liking. Wanting is, the, is associated with the drive that pushes us towards a reward. And liking is associated with the pleasure in consuming that reward. We can also think of the liking as the element that teaches us that something is good, which in turn strengthens the wanting for that very thing. Of course, we need to experience something in order to be able to like it. So all I'm trying to say here is that intrinsic motivation itself is shaped by experience. And this applies also to working out. This is because there is a strong physical pleasure component in working out and it increases the fitter we are since being fit reduces the strain required in performing a particular move. So the more we work out, the more we actually become motivated to work out because the, we consume the liking part of physical exertion. So we strengthen the wanting for that. This means that, in a way, we become addicted to exercise. But I've explained how we want to exercise more the more we exercise. But surely now you must think, what is the element that initially pushes us to reaching this level in which I exercise so much that that in itself is motivating me? There must be some other type of intrinsic motivation or some other type of initial motivation. Given that so far I've been talking about an intrinsic motivation mechanism, perhaps one might think that some sort of extrinsic motivation is the initial motivation. However, I think that extrinsic motivation on its own is not sufficient to initially test our physical limits. This is because the exter ex external motivation can only be envisioned under a rational viewpoint. Of course, having an aesthetic physique is praised and winning in sport is admired, but it's only when we actually experience these that we can internalize them. So we like the experience and we will want more of that. But extrinsic motivation 
initially can only push us towards participation, but not necessarily effort. So participation would be, for example, showing up at the gym. And effort would be pushing that extra rep in whilst we're working out. So participation is more common than effort. When we see many people showing up at the gym, they have their gear, their supplements, their you know, old routine with written plans, but all of this is just extended participation. So there must be something else that initially pushes us um, and something else at the foundation of our effort. And this must come not only from experiencing firsthand the benefits of exercising, but believing deep down that it is the right thing to do. For example, I never had anyone telling me to work out, if anything, all the opposite. But I be really believed in it and I've never done it for other people's approval. It's, like, it's a bit like when you go to school. It shouldn't be for the grades, but it should be for your own education and betterment. This reminds me of a quote from the philosopher Epicurus, who said that, among other gratifications, give up the one that comes from other people's approval. And that was 300 BC, so a long time ago. When trying to achieve something remarkable, one should do it because they believe it intrinsically good. Um, and that goes for both your mind and your body. So now you might ask, why then should we believe that working out is intrinsically good? Which is the key question here. Um, clearly, we need to first understand the importance of our body and the value of it. We all know a variety of reasons um, for which we should you know, maintain our body. It's good for your health, uh, it makes you look good, it makes you feel good, and so on. But right now, I'm looking for a more existential reason. The relationship between mind and body has been at the center of uh, Western philosophy for centuries. And the main question has always been of which comes first, the body or the mind? In classical times, great importance was attributed to the body. Mens sana in corpore sano, healthy mind in healthy body, has by far been always my favorite Latin motto. This morality of the healthy body was lost with the rise of Christianity and the decline of the Roman Empire. In Christianity, the body is degraded in favor of an eternal and very valuable soul. So even later on, at the inception of uh, modern philosophy, the body was still considered secondary. For example, Descartes, who is considered the father of rationalism, reduced the human being to a purely thinking thing. His starting point was a fundamental doubt. He asked, if also when I'm asleep and I'm dreaming, I seem to be feeling things around me and seeing things, then how do I know that reality itself isn't an illusion? In order to have any certainty at all, the first thing to do is to eliminate anything that can be doubted. But the only thing that remains certain is that I'm thinking about all of these things, whether they're real or not. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. This means that the mind is what determines our existence. So in a way, the mind comes before the body. And even our sensations, according to Descartes, are only different modes of thinking. This supremacy of the mind over the body has truly shaped Western culture. So studying, for example, is universally accepted as a good thing, a positive thing, but taking care of your body, building a physique is still more niche and in many occasions is considered vain. Right now, I'd like to 
see things from a different perspective. I just presented the fact that, you know, the mind has a strong influence over um, your body under a rationalist viewpoint, which is a, in many ways a positive message, but also the opposite can be a positive message. And uh, this was later offered by existentialism. So Kierkegaard, who is considered the first existentialist philosopher, stated that the human reason has boundary, so a very opposing view with respect to rationalism. And uh, Sartre, in the 20th century, asserted that existence comes before essence, which means that each one of us is uniquely responsible for our own self-affirmation and purpose. Or, to put it more simply, we need to act existence before we can think existence. And not vice versa, like rationalism would have it. This implicitly is a reaffirmation of the importance of the body as the element establishing our existence in this world. Under an existentialist viewpoint, therefore, the body comes before the mind. Some people might not like this view. Well, they might say, well, you give so much importance to the body, but what about the soul? Giving importance to the body does not demean the importance of the soul. In fact, under an existentialist viewpoint, there is still room for God and spiritualism. We could, for example, like Kierkegaard suggested, admit the limits of human reason and reach God through a leap of faith. Of course, a very different view was held by Nietzsche, who declared the death of God in favor of an all-powerful and self-affirming life force. With this life force, the body becomes once again the epicenter of our intelligence, like it was in classical times. Purer and more honest of speech is the healthy body, perfect and square built, and it speaks of the meaning of the earth. I love this quote from the book, the Thus Spoke Zarathustra. So appreciating the philosophical importance of the body is the first step when trying to establish how the body affects the mind. I want to explore this a bit further. When practicing mindfulness, one focuses deeply on sensations in order to achieve that sense of unity with the surrounding, which ultimately has a gratifying effect on the mind. This can be compared to the experience of meditation, in which, via the careful control of your body through stillness, breathing and posture, one can attain an ecstatic state of the mind. A very comparable state can be actually achieved through the practice of sports, especially endurance sports and sports that require high level of focus or that involve high levels of adrenaline. The effect of adrenaline and endorphins, in my view, can lead to an almost mystical experience. I have personally experienced, in some circumstances, a reduced sense of subjectivity and an enhanced sense of gratitude. So simply put, stimulating my body has a strong effect on my mind insofar as the experiences I just described make me happier. And this kind of reward will reinforce the intrinsic motivation like I explained earlier by strengthening the wanting for that. So, believe in your body using your mind and push your mind using your body. Find your own intrinsic motivation in philosophy and in exercise. You don't have to choose to be either an intellectual or an athlete. You can and you should really be both. Thank you.